joining us. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Library Services, and I'd like to welcome you all to our final Talking in the Library event for this semester. Uh, the Talking in the Library series is generously supported by an alumna of the university, the late Mary Tuft White, and um, the, her donation also made possible this programming space that we're in right now, which is really high tech and wonderful. Um, this evening, we are delighted to present the voice of poetry in poems and prose featuring poet and memoirist Michael Klein, who will read from some of his works and then will be available for questions afterwards. So please stay and ask lots of questions. Adam Braver, professor of creative writing and our library program director, will introduce our speaker in just a moment. I'd like to briefly mention a couple of our events um, planned for this spring semester. In March, we'll present a panel of scholars on Zoom as part of the library's annual John Howard Burst Jr. program to discuss this year's selection, Carson McCullough's novel, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. That event will be accompanied by both digital and physical um, exhibitions prepared by our library staff. In April, we will host the novelist Sigrid Nunes in person as part of the Vermont Fellowship in Fiction and Creative Nonfiction. We will be sending out information about these events soon, and I do hope all of you will join us. And now, Professor Braber will introduce our speaker. Thank you. All right. In thinking of the writer Michael Klein, one's first thought comes to Michael Klein, the poet. And why not? As early as his teenage years, he studied with the important and influential poet, Adrian Rich. And as he began writing and publishing, it was his poetry that garnered attention. It's exemplified by a Huffington Post review in which the writer, reviewer writes, quote, one looks to Michael Klein not for intricacies of craft or starbursts of poetic form, but simply, and to put it directly, damn good poetry. Klein's approachable verse is deceptively unimposing, unadorned, and, under, and un, understated. I'm still quoting from the review. In fact, the poet says much in demotic terminology that can only be emotionally possessed, processed at the level of the sublime. Michael has published three books of poems, edited numerous anthologies, and published countless poems in journals and magazines, as well as being considered a first-rate teacher of poetry in the classroom. So it stands to reason. But that only tells part of the story. What about the memoirs? Most notably, Michael's first, Track Conditions, in which he recounts the period of his life when he worked at a racetrack as a groom, as groom to a Kentucky Derby winning horse, while also taking the reader through his own path towards sobriety. What about the essays, the criticism? all equal in focus, intellect, and artfulness. To appreciate the full scope of this writer, one might look to Michael's 2015 collection, which is in his hand, When I Was a Twin, a book that includes poetry, essays, and criticism, one that Philip Clark, writing for Lambda Literary, noted is, quote, more than poetry, though even the prose pieces and essays are filled with it. You cannot tell where the prose ends or the poetry begins. Michael Klein writes every sentence with such attention as if every word were a particular person he was addressing." End quote. So yes, no doubt that Michael Klein's literary reputation may reside in the body of the poet. But perhaps it is best to think of Michael Klein as someone beyond genre, instead as someone engaged in the art language. So please welcome Michael Klein. It's all lies. Thank you. That was a really lovely introduction, um, which is a rare thing these days if you go to readings, um, particularly in academia. So I always appreciate it. I'm gonna read a bunch of stuff. Um, I won't keep you too long. I'm gonna put this, I do have to, oh, thank you, is that better? Thank you. Um, I do have to time it because I have a tendency to go on and on and on, um, which my students constantly are aware. I'm a very tangential teacher, 
and I go on a lot of tangents when I'm teaching. Um, and it works most of the time. I won't do that today. I'm just going to read poems. And I will tell you a little bit about it. Um, when I read the prose, I'll tell you a little bit about where that's coming from. Um, I'm, but I'm going to start with some poems. And this is one that I really wanted to read, but I forgot to print out. It's called Drinking Money. In 1939, when my mother was seven years old, the lyricist Lorenz Hart gave her a photograph of himself on which he had inscribed in midnight blue ink for Catherine Jacqueline from Lorenz Hart, whose name will probably be forgotten by the time she's able to read this. Hart had been a friend of my grandfather's, my grandfather a vaudevillian. I remember reading Hart's inscription for the first time and thinking it was an extraordinary thing for someone to say to a child, as if childhood had the same kind of unpredictability and loneliness that fame did. I inherited that photograph after my mother's death and sold it to an autograph dealer on 18th Street for drinking money. In the museum of saddest things I've ever done, that could have been the saddest. It felt like I was making fun of beauty. I have about three subjects. <laughs> Drunkenness. I'm sober 37 years. Um, sobriety, I guess, the flip side of drunkenness. Um, and I am a twin, which I write a lot about. And this, he died in 2002, and I wrote this poem before that. It's called The Twin. I wasn't supposed to have a body. I'm not from a family of bodies. None of us were supposed to have bodies. But then the light left us in a dark chamber, and each one of us stood in the hall of my mother's heart beating. My mother and my brother were there, I was inhabiting a body of company. Could I have my own apart from the one I was inside, apart from the one floating next to me which looked like mine? My soul was already confused. It didn't know how consciousness pulls the body into the world or pulls it out. My soul was inside the inside. All this, I was thinking, still lying there in my mother's cocktail, only a light filling a body, frail in the counter music of my brother's heart, singing in my brother's body and in the same time of his body that mine was in. Then 48 years later, my brother died and dropped his body on a bed. And I carried the effect of him afterwards down some coiling st stairs into the streets of Boston. Music, garments, literature, some beauty stuff. When he was living, we used to dare each other. I dare you, he said. I dare you. And then he died. So it is true, I, <laughs> a quick segue, <laughs> it is true that I, I groomed the Kentucky Derby winner in 1984. His name was Swale. That's me with the horse after losing the prep race to the Derby, which was at Keeneland in Lexington, Kentucky, which is a racetrack that is so snobby that they don't have a track announcer. They figured that everybody knows the, the, the silks and who owns the horse. And, um, but he was in a prep race um, before the Derby and he lost miserably and we all thought he was gonna lose, but he didn't and this is, um, a poem that I wrote. I wrote a, you know, I wrote a memoir about him, but I also, and I wouldn't think he would find his way into poetry because of the memoir, but he did, and this is called Swale. It's Derby Day, and it's been 30 years since 1984 when I stood in the grandstand at Churchill Downs after betting 20 bucks on Swale, the horse I groomed and watched as he pulled away from Wayne Lucas's great filly, Althea to win the 110th running of the race, 30 years. And a lot of souls have risen to the upper register of life. And my own life has been made more reachable by what their love did to me. I read some books and wrote some books and watched performances that moved my thinking left. 
I've seen the man who gave me horses go home to his mother, and I've seen other horses break down or go home to the grasses of their beginning to make more blazing kind. And after it all, I met the love of my life. And when the government turned something over, I married him foolishly, only because all marriage is foolish, an errand into a maze. It's Derby Day, and I'm remembering my life in an errand into a maze. It's Derby Day, and I'm remembering my life in a stable and the ordinary living that spilled around it. I've eaten good food in places that had views of the everlasting, and I'm certain I've seen the face of God on more than one occasion. And I've held animals so close to my own body that something in theirs must have passed through mine. But nothing has given me more life than watching that big, black, beautiful, shining soul run through the animal line, past all comprehension, into the music of his speed, and win that race on the first Saturday in May, in the year of forever. Here's to Swale, and to others of his kind, creature of my joy and of my sorrow. Cancel culture. <laughs> and later, in the room upstairs, empty because it's a lookout, we are staring at the cardinal in a tree, and I say, he's so red. And James says, almost too red. And I say, and a little fat, actually. And then I say, great, let's criticize birds. That's funny, that poem. And I'm only saying that because it's like the only funny poem I've ever written. <laughs> and of course, it's transcribed from an actual conversation. Um, James is a wonderful actor and writer named James Lacine, who's now known as Celeste Lacine. Um, speaking of animals, this is called The Animals, The Animals. Here I am, I've been watching The Animals. I watch them in the afternoon that seems to drop me lower into time. Bullfrogs singing from the long grasses, horses captured in a video. Wild is a horse's word. They are running wild on an island and ending sharply as if stopped by something that isn't there. I've been watching the animals move through sudden predicaments or work like joy from a habit as in the sea turtle pulling her anvil body down to the continent of ocean and leaving her eggs in the upper sands. She's returning to single life and the sequent minutes of light breaking softly on the surface of the water. How delicate it is below where daylight doesn't reach all the wet and green, one world brushing up against the slippery gardens of another. I've been watching the animals with more knowing than childhood secret knowing, secret gratitude for animals. And my spirit seems to make music I can hear for each one, like a theme for staying. Only once did the dog run away. I've been watching them with a sense of circling back into myself through their restlessness, feeling their nature take the wheel of what's on again, off again in my life the life of human stories beginning in deliverance and ending up torn from reaching the eventual. There is nothing in the world to confirm or not confirm the fear that I will stay like this, disillusioned with everything that isn't animally connected or unconditional. I will always regret not staying with someone only for love and remain powerless over the photographic grief of empty stations that once held people. I will always be just this, the human boy, the human man who goes to animals, the animals to check, to see. I'm gonna read two more poems and then some prose. Where am I in time? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I got so nervous at this shit. Oh, not bad. Okay. This is called Beginners. Truth. Oh, I'm 67 <laughs> years old. Um, and so this poem is like when I was a kid in the 60s. Truth leaked through time in 1963, 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. And Gary Oren's nervous laughter at the news of Kennedy's 12.30 Central Murder. 
coming through as a bad spill of static over PS41's cheap PA. There's Greenwich Village, a drowsy dandelion, I called it once. There's the heartsick monitor of trouble in the afternoon. My mother is late to pick me up again. She's almost better, but will never manage the cure. Outside American family life, nothing really happens until OJ and a glove. But I can't rely on memory alone to determine what it means to bring closer. I know feelings can change the math of time, and we're wrong about feelings anyway. They are facts, which is why I go to my dog for all the important stuff. She's rifling through her morning bowl in the galley kitchen of both our late adulthoods. Poor Ruby. She wants to feel as much as I do. She is eating the world to save it. Um, I'm working on a memoir, the tentative title of which is uh, Radical Loneliness and the Life Imaginary. And it's a story of an experience that I had in 2016, right around you know what, in the White House, and being very badly ripped off. On, I was catfished, basically. Um, and the, whole, the reason I'm writing about it is because it's something that, that somebody who looked like me, <laughs> that it happened to that person. Because I've never behaved this way in my entire life. And I thought it was, I had started taking Lyrica for arthritis, and I thought it was a side effect of the drug, and I never really knew, but I kept in the, the, um, the scam, because I kept thinking it was gonna change. And of course, I was in love with this guy, right? Um, and there's so much, it was so complicated. And this is the beginning, I'm gonna read, I guess I'm gonna read this, and then I'll read from Track Conditions. Um, but this is the part, pretty much near the beginning of it. Um, it's very difficult to write. Um, I usually need a lot of time between something that happened and when I write about it, particularly when it's prose. Um, and there are books that actually suffer from this, where the memoirist actually starts writing way too soon. I won't mention any titles, but there's one very well-known <laughs> memoir. And it was just too close to the event to be objective about it. And there is an objectivity, I think, that's very essential to memoir writing. Um, but it's also about the way you remember something, right? Which nobody can criticize, Tobias Wolf. And this is, so this is near the beginning of the book. <clears throat> and I'm a little nervous because I've never read it out loud. I usually have a pen, oh, here's a pen, because I'll probably make changes while I'm reading it. <laughs> I left my body to go online and found the devil on the same channel as love. He was setting it up the bait, the plan, the money. I didn't know what he was doing until I knew what he was doing. The only thing I knew was that he had to leave his body the way I had to leave my body for us to meet in the same place at the same time. The body electric tapping the space of another body electric. I had forgotten how long the body itself can feel virtual. And when it happens, a kind of longing emerges as if you've been waiting a long time to be made of light. I had waited a long time to be made of light. That was the year I wasn't there because of the decision to hurl into space. That was the year I couldn't perform a job I was good at or remember appointments or dates that I had made with friends. I once got a phone call during a class I was teaching, and it was my friend Marie wondering where I was because we were supposed to meet for a movie 15 minutes ago. I remember we were gonna plan to see each other, but I don't recall finding the date or the movie or the time. That was the year time felt the way a sundial turns it into a shadow across the exact length of itself. I was in something bad, and I knew it but I took it to its finish because it was breaking apart in the middle, and I wanted to see if I could take it from the middle to the end by fixing it. I needed help, but never asked for it or didn't know how to ask. What happened made me ashamed and embarrassed. The one or two people I did give parts of the story to seemed to be more entertained by the way I was telling it than offer anything like advice. Or maybe they just hadn't known me long enough to know what I considered actual in trouble. 
I suffered every moment it was happening and ecstatic at every moment it was happening. It was as if I was discovering sensations in my body where two kinds of upheavals were happening at the same time. The lower part of my body was in ecstasy and everything happening from the lower part to the heart and from there to the head was suffering. I suffered the air I was breathing. I wasn't in sync with what I looked like and I felt what I looked like. I wasn't eating, but not very much. And not very much. And if it was a day that I was eating, it was just dinner and minutes before going to bed. I didn't always remember to take a shower. I wasn't connecting. I wasn't connected to people except to one person who I spoke to and or texted every day in the broad daylight of never seeing him and knowing I would never see him. I was connecting to the one person who was slowly taking my money while I was wasting time trying to figure out how to get him to last in love until he paid me back. That was the year I met a geologist who preposterously called himself Clive Owen. Oh, come on, that's an actor. Okay, he revised, Clive Owen Simpson. You don't actually meet people online, you find them. And then I disappeared with Clive Owen Simpson into a geologist's dream because nothing about him was true or awake except an unidentifiable accent and phone number. The photograph of himself looking like a schoolboy, handsome, sexy, I guess, underneath. None of it was true. Where was he calling from? Where was I calling to? He was the only one who always knew where both of us were at the same time. Where was he calling from? Reality works because of the names for things. We wouldn't know what anything is if it didn't, we didn't have the word for it. So if Clive Owen Simpson says he's calling from Alaska, Alaska is the name from the place he is calling from, even if he wasn't calling from Alaska. There's nothing about reality that says you can't switch the names around. Clive Owen Simpson is a geologist who's calling from Alaska. And later, Clive Owen Simpson is a geologist calling from Canada. He dug the earth. And later, when the criminal nature of the relationship became morbidly clear, he's calling from London. London, where he said he was settling his dead father's affairs and needed $20,000 to pay the estate attorneys. And where, when I called the manager of the hotel he'd been living in for a week to pay his bill, I heard distinct and loud chickens squawking in the background. Chickens about which one of my friends who was getting the timeline of my fucked up life then replied, he wasn't in London. He was in Nigeria. You've been talking and falling in love with a Nigerian. With AIDS, probably, I said. I know that's a mean sentence at the end, but I said it. Um, and this is from Track Conditions. I'm going to read the last two chapters. Um, but don't let that sway you from not reading the book. I have, a, I have two friends, actually, who when they go to a bookstore, they read the last couple of sentences of the book, and if they don't like it, they don't get the book. One of them is Jacqueline Woodson, who's like a really wonderful writer. I said, Jacqueline, that's terrible. But I, I do the same thing now. It works, actually. But you should never know the end of the book. There's this great story. I, I just have to tell you the story for the writers in the room. Um, I took a workshop with the wonderful writer Andre Debuse the third, because I needed... Um, um, what did I need? I needed confidence. I was having a really hard time with this thing I'm writing. And he's a wonderful teacher. Um, and he tells this wonderful story about Mary McCarthy, who was a very well-known um, fiction, I guess fiction, yeah, she wrote the group and, and memoirs from the 50s, I guess. Yeah, 50s. And this is the time before computers and everything, right? And she had just finished a novel and lost the manuscript somehow. And somebody at a party, and she was known to have a very good memory. And somebody at a party said, Mary McCarthy, what, what, what's the problem? You have such a good memory. I'm sure you can just rewrite the book, right? And she said, oh, no, I can't do that. And the woman said, well, why not? And she said, I know how it ends. Isn't that great? You should never know how it ends until you get to the end. I think. It depends what you're writing. But I love not knowing how it's going to end. How is it going to end? It's the big existential question. No horses. The, um, very briefly, this is a book about the racetrack, the, and my 
grooming this Kentucky Derby winner named Swale, who was owned by millionaires on a, from a farm called Claiborne. And then he died of a heart attack. But it was very mysterious. I had been fired from being his groom for my, basically my alcoholism. And, um, and when he died, it was really strange. Like, I was not allowed anywhere near the barn. But my boyfriend at the time um, was living in this place that we had been living in on the track. And I, was, I spent the night with him, I guess, or whatever. And that day, I could hear Swale outside. You know, he was right outside the door. The, the, the places where people who worked on the track lived were right next to the barn. And, we, and I heard this horse, like, kill over and just and die, basically. Um, and I got out of there really quickly because I thought, they would thought, I thought people would think I had something to do with it. Like I was, it was a revenge killing for being fired. So anyway, he died. And this, these last two chapters are about his burial and about me ending up in rehab. And I got sober. I got sober in 1984, which is the year he died. Because of his death, I got sober. Well, because of my death, too. <laughs> no horses. Seth Hancock, who owned the horse, asked the Bourbon Lumber Company to build a box big enough for a horse and then line it in yellow satin. A racehorse usually gets buried in sections, head, heart, hooves, testicles, the parts the fire is in. I imagine it was Swale's champion status. He had won the Eclipse Award that year for top three-year-old that entitled him to full treatment in death. And of course, he was Claiborne's first star, having risen over the farm at a time when they needed a star to confirm that it was the right choice to raise their own yearlings instead of selling them. The coffin was delivered one bright August morning, and everyone who worked at Claiborne took the day off to bury Swale. The champion of so many dreams lies today in the same meadow he got lost in one morning before he had a name. I wasn't at that funeral, as public as the death was due to the media. It was the headline of the Post the day he died. Its aftermath was stunning in its privacy, and so was my broken heart. Stumbling around in amazement and grief is a common sight on the racetrack, so nobody paid any special attention to me. Before Swale's death, I had been seriously contemplating suicide, and now I was in shock. I still wanted to die even more intensely, but the profound loss drained me of the ability to make any kind of decision, rational or irrational. For the first time in my life, drinking was losing its effect. The only way I could see through the first movement of this grief was to have my hand on a racehorse again. I got a job hot walking for Mary Carter, my last official job on the racetrack. I had drunk a lot the night before and was very tired. I fell in the shed row, still holding on to the horse's shank. Instead of taking off with me the way aid to reason had taken off with me at Latonia, the horse looked down at me in a locked stare. What are you doing, the horse seemed to be saying. For the first time since being in a courtroom in Bennington, Vermont, I was in the presence again of something I couldn't touch with my mind. Suddenly, inexplicably, in the silent and frozen stare from a horse came this. I don't want to drink anymore. The horse's look went so far inside of me that it made me a different person. And this, you don't have to drink exactly what Richard had been telling me at least once a week for 12 years. David M., the only person I knew on the track, excuse me, I'm getting like pill mouth. I don't know what that is, like this is really, like I've taken pills, and I haven't. I am sober 37 years, I told you that, right? <laughs> ah, sobriety, a mystery to be celebrated. David M., the only person I knew on the track who had gotten sober, took me to Nassau County, Nassau Community Hospital and admitted to me, and admitted me to the detox ward. I was put on Librium for five days, attended group therapy sessions, and watched a film called Chalk Talk, in which a man named Father Martin talked about the disease of alcoholism. Everything he said went as far inside me as the look the anonymous horse gave me on Mary Carter's shed row the first horse I'd met in all those years on the racetrack whose name I didn't know, which took time back to the beginning of the racetrack when horses didn't have names yet. 
the way it was down in Aiken. A week later, I went to Plainview Rehabilitation Center and began the slow process of recovery. The sliver of world going on without me didn't matter anymore. I hadn't given up drinking as much as given in. The date was July 17th, 1984. Swale was dead a month. This chapter, the last chapter is called Merton's Fan. Thomas Merton. <laughs> Plainview Rehab was once a sanitarium, and each room externally connects to the next by a large veranda where, I'd been told, the staff would roll the patients out in their hospital beds for doses of sunlight. The hallways there are long and wide and dark, so dark that it's hard to tell what time of day it is. The hall seemed disconnected from the rest of the building in that way because the sources of light from the windows in the patients' rooms and from the verandas further out are too far away for any of it to penetrate the building's central artery. Walking down those halls felt like being on a scavenger hunt through a cave where the prizes at the end were light and time, and as it happened, the prize of the rest of our lives if we wanted it. I got weekend passes after being in rehab a month, and I used to take the bus and train back to Belmont Park to visit Richard, who was, he was my boyfriend, who was still working for Woody Stevens. It felt strange knowing Richard had stayed behind in a barn that had dissolved in my bloodstream, along with the Librium, the nurse administered in detox to keep me from jumping out of my skin. Richard and I would meet at the diner across the street from the track, a favorite place of ours. It reminded us of the famous diner on 46th Street and 9th Avenue, where we had gone practically every Sunday morning during the years we lived in Hell's Kitchen. On those visits back to the track, Richard and I would sit in a booth in the silence of amazement over Swale's death and my own being sober. It was hard for Richard to face me at the beginning, even in the first months of not drinking. I was already so different, steadier, not looking for an argument. And almost immediately it seemed I wasn't nearly as emotionally dependent on him as I had been those many years. It was as though the alcohol had provided the only cause for longing, and without it I was actually beginning to enjoy my own company. A sense of well-being kept shooting through me like cold water, and I became interested in books and music and even clothes again. And I didn't have the physical desire for alcohol. Call it God or whatever you want, the desire had been lifted from me. Still, it wasn't easy. I shook for three months and couldn't stay awake for more than six or seven hours a day. They told us in rehab that for many recovering drunks, the hardest thing to face in the beginning was what to do with unstructured time. It seemed as if the only thing I could concentrate on was what a book said. I was immersed in Thomas Merton's secular work, No Man is an Island, <laughs> on the one hand, and, and Thomas A. Kempis' sacred imitation of Christ on the other. I couldn't listen to what people said to me in the beginning. Mostly I was spiritually and psychically exhausted. But after the few months in rehab when my body and mind started feeling more energetic, I started talking a lot to the other members of my daily therapy group and was eating regularly for the first time in 10 years. I also began to understand the way it must be for a crash victim coming out of a coma, that this was the world I remembered before the accident. I wanted to live there again. I was never the kind of alcoholic who, through a per a period, who went through a period of laying off the sauce for a while. I drank to get drunk, to dream, to shift into the blackout. I lied and told the track officials I never had when I was caring for Swale. And while it seemed so inconceivable that I could actually manage to stop poisoning myself, there was a key in Swale's death that somehow turned the lock in a door that for years had been shut and dead bolted to me. Swales was the first death that alcohol couldn't alter the depth of. My mother's death, on the other hand, mixed well with alcohol. So sobriety was the only choice I had left if I wanted to live. And continuing life has been the light motif of abstinence. In a way, it's all you get with sobriety. What some people would term a reprieve is just really holding on to a life you have more interest in. But it all feels like a mystery somehow. 
It's never been easy being sober, and as I said, it didn't come easily, just emphatically. While I don't think Swale would have appeared in my life unless I had been an active alcoholic, the road out of New York, that first trip to Riverdown in Cincinnati, was laid down in inebriation. His death let me get sober. My mother, my lover, and my horse were gone, and something about Swale's vanishing told me it was time to take drastic measures, something clear as day. The blurry effect of a drunk wasn't an appropriate response to a world that had now been empty of the three great forces of love in my life. But why credit Mary Cotter's horse when I could credit God? Because the God I felt tremble one time in the voice of a judge dropping charges in Bennington, Vermont, hadn't been heard from for too long. And the horse? Well, he appeared when I needed him the most and wouldn't run off with me. When I first stopped drinking and told some sober friends that a horse got me sober, they all laughed, of course, but then as quickly as they responded lightheadedly, they went silent. Why couldn't it have been a horse leading me out of the fire? In early sobriety, the explainable and unexplainable very often ride the same wave, which makes sobriety different than drunkenness. When you're drunk, only one thing happens. My years on the track make a great story to people I barely know to tell people I barely know. All of this, the derby, the drinking, the governor of Kentucky who I threw a drink in her face at that party, um, the lover in and out of my life, so many kinds of dying. And it's 12 years later and still no one really knows what happened to Swale. Pathologists at the New Bolton Clinic in Pennsylvania spent months looking into his heart and could only find a small tear there, nothing dreadful enough to have killed him. It will always be a case unsolved, matched in my mind with the conundrum of trying to explain how Swell ever came into my life to begin with. And when I first got to playing rehab, I kept overlaying Swale's story in my mind over the one about the death of Thomas Merton. I had been reading the seven-story mountain and thinking about the electric fan that killed the writer after it toppled over into his Bangkok bathtub. The fan spun madly in my imagination, making it hard to read any of the beautiful sentences that Merton had written about his early life. And when the fan stopped, Swale appeared to me in the most lasting image I will ever have of him, just after he won the Young America Stakes at the Meadowlands. Black horse, snow. Because it isn't the season for flowers, Swale is wrapped in a blanket of white satin like a boxer. At one point before we get back on the van for home, he stops at a paperweight's worth of snow falling in front of a little light over a doorway of one of the concrete barns they have at the Meadowlands, studying its descent. Or is he? He nuzzles his big head into my chest because the world is cold again. But, but, but by this time, I know he's discovered where the human heart is. We're both still, we're both, we both are so still in that moment when snow can actually make you feel warm. The van is waiting, but we're not in a hurry. I'm with the snow. I'm with the ambiguous moment with gravity. When the direction of its falling isn't clear, up or down, the snow can't decide. But in that light, in swale time, I know all it can do is fall up. Thank you. Get it, Mike. Is this on? Okay, it is on. <laughs> um, hi, um, hi, I'm Kat. And um, first of all, wow, <laughs> um, beautiful work. Um, and my question was, how um, is writing or like poetry or just any kind of writing? Uh, was it a form of like coping for you, like for your alcoholism or any kind of grief? Right now I'm in a class and we're looking at Natasha Trethewey mm -hmm. and it's very clear that her poetry is a form of like her grieving. Mm -hmm. And I would just... Um, it absolutely, it starts there, but I would never call, and I'm really conscious of this, particularly when I'm teaching, that um, writing is not a form of therapy. It may feel like that, and obviously because I write very close, 
I mean, everything I write is autobiographical, and I'm also extremely open. I really, you know, I really, I really try to be dangerous. I mean, you know, I try, I try to write about things I'm afraid of writing about, um, which to me is the whole point of writing, is to find language for something that seems unsayable. And so in that way, yeah, it's therapeutic, but, it, but it's also an art, you know what I mean? And, and when you really get involved with sentences and syntax and all that stuff that, that makes writing what it is, you move quickly away from the therapeutic aspect of it. I'm lucky in that I've had a really fucked up life. Um, I have a lot of material. I mean, I'm being very honest with you. And it's, but it's also been material that I know as a writer has to be transcended. Not, and not just because of, so other people can understand what I'm talking about. It has to be transcended because, it, because writing is an art. You know what I mean? And, and so this is a long answer to your, your question. But yeah, it starts, it starts off in therapy, but the more you do it, it becomes, it's a spiritual practice is really what it becomes. I look at it that way. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Instead of praying, I write. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is, when you write poetry, do the words sound the same in your head as they do when you read them out loud? Like, do you do you kind of sound it out almost in your head, like what you, what you, how you want the poetry to sound? You mean before I write it? Yeah. No, but there are people who do that. No, no not at all, never. Um, I start with usually I start with an image or an idea, um, but the way that sound does come into it, it is that I write. I've written a lot of poems in which the next word or or a series of words will be based on how they sound and not necessarily what they mean. And then I'm lucky enough that when I look that up in terms of context, it, it usually fits. Um, so, and I'm very influenced by music as a writer. Um, I'm always thinking of writing as a kind of composition. That it, it is a musical form. The great writing is a musical form, it's a miracle. I mean, and we always hear people when they talk about novels or something that isn't poetry, the greatest compliment you can always give is that it's poetic, right? The way that sort of Adam is introducing me. But it is true. I mean, that, that's something that I think is really, um, Nabokov always thought that, you know, he said, everybody should read poetry, but that it sort of stops there. <laughs> like, he didn't believe that you could, you could actually become a great writer if all he wrote was poetry, which is complete bullshit, but whatever. Um, but I think it's, it's essential if you're serious about writing to read poetry, if you're not writing it. It's essential, it's where language happens. Language does not happen in information. There's so much prose. You know, there's this wonderful essay by Lynn Emanuel called Why I Write Poetry, and one of the things she talks about is, um, I don't care how Raoul gets to the elevator, which is prose. How does Raoul get to the elevator? What color are the curtains? What color is the sweater? Who the fuck cares? And that's, she said, that's what, she, you know, of course it's all context, but that's, it shows poetry because you don't have to do things like that. You don't have to have sentences that are merely cargoing information. Right? And novels are built, and a lot of novels are built that way. I mean, if you take a novel and you look at certain sentences, it's like, I mean, the great writers don't do this. I mean, who can I think of right now? Sandra Nunez, who's coming, is, what is a great example. Every sentence, you know, I mean, Cormac McCarthy, every sentence. Faulkner, I mean, those, you know, every sentence is made as a sentence that then becomes part of the whole, right? But, they're built, but, any, but it's all built on sentence making. And if you don't write a sentence, it's interesting. It's not, you know, I don't care about what's going on, whether with the plot or character film or anything else. Jamaican Kincaid is another one. That was no sentence. It's built in the owls, the theater group for the New Yorker. I and mean, these people are writing sentences like blow your mind, right? William Maxwell, who's my favorite writer, actually. But anyway, long, you know, when I start talking about books, I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. What's your name? Uh, ben, Ben, ben Harvey. Do you write poetry or prose? Um, so, sometimes I dabble in both, but I'm more of a prose guy. Good. Well, just concentrate on those sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying my best. Sometimes really? I don't come out. And in an essay by Louis Maxwell, he talks about getting older. And one of the things he says is, um, he's 90, and he says, I still enjoy making sentences, but I, I think I've forgotten where stories come from. But I still like making sentences. It all starts with the sentence, right? Even in poetry, I mean, lines of poetry are considered sentences, even if it's not end stopped. 
you know, or a jammed or whatever device or strategy you're using. But I like it when it blurs. I really like the hybrid from things that are happening with hybrid text, fragments, a novel telling fragments, a novel with no dialogue. It's a great novel called The, the End of the Story by Lydia Davis um, that has no dialogue in it. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Yakety, yakety, yak. Chris Paley was the only person in America that could write dialogue, as far as I can tell, if you haven't read her work. An incredible dialogue. They were so idiosyncratic, those characters. They spoke like real people. So. I have a second question, sure. uh, but I want to make sure if anyone else, if anyone else has a question. Alright, um... That'd be good, then. <laughs> <laughs> um... Did you start, like, did you start kind of, you know, when we're talking about sentence structure and we're talking about sentences and poetry and, you know, making things sound interesting, kind of what's your origin for, for where you started in general for writing and how did you make your writing as interesting as it is um, itself? No, oh, thank you for that last part. I started out as a songwriter. I started, I was very heavily influenced by Johnny Mitchell and Laura Nero. I don't know if any of you who know who Laura Nero is, but if you don't, check her out. She's extraordinary, right? And the album that I would suggest is called New York Ten to Barry, but she was a major. We went to the same high school, I went to music in our high school in New York, and we went to the same high school, and I had this incredible bond with her. And she wrote lyrics that didn't rhyme. And, and Tom Waits was another big influence on my work. Um, lyricists, singing Sondheim. Time. Cole Porter. I mean, I just listened to music. I didn't read that much. I didn't read a novel until I was 20. I was afraid of it. Because I'd only read poetry. And I read poetry because it was short. And I could take out 20 books in the library at the same time and get them and read them in a week. How, well, how, that's bliss, right? A novel would take me, you know, a year to read. Um, but from the song lyrics, and then I wrote, so I wrote song lyrics, and then um, I started writing poetry. After that, I was about 15, and, I was really, and, then I, and it just sort of evolved, and I started reading a lot. And Adrian Rich came into my life when I was 15, and she, um, she was an example of somebody who could, who could be a poet in the world. Um, I love the fact that you didn't make money at it. That's one of the reasons I chose it, because money was never important to me. I wanted to be happy, you know, and money had nothing to do with that equation. And I love poetry, and Andrew, which was extraordinary. I met Elizabeth Hardwick, I met, I met all these other writers. Jean Valentine was a poet who died last year, who was a very a mentor to me for many, many, many years. So I had great people around me, and I had a lot to do with it. It's very important to find your people when you're writing, because it's very lonely, you know? Even when it's not indulgent. <laughs> Even if you're making shit up. Like, you know, in an in and all or something. So, thank you for coming, guys. I appreciate it. We're I happy to show here. shot. That was, that was so temporary. <laughs> that was great. I love reading from for college students. And thank you, Adam. Is that another question? Oh, oh I, we got time for another one? Absolutely. Yeah. I do. I do. Oh. I go anyway. Anybody know a good restaurant in Bristol? <laughs> Bristol Oyster Bar. Oh, okay, you know, the, the oyster bar. Huh? <laughs> That's all that was mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. What's your question? What's your name? Uh, Sabrina. I said, oh, Sabrina. <laughs> and Bogart and Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> oh my god, the great movies. <laughs> yes? Um, so it's kind of like a two folded question because um, first I was thinking. How do you write something and not feel like it's pretentious? Like you know it's your voice. But then what if your voice is pretentious? But um my <laughs> I mean, but did you think it was pretentious? No, that's why I was like, because sometimes I read some of my stuff and I'm like, oh, who is this? Oh I know, yeah, yeah, I get I get it. So it's that's the first fold. What's the second fold? Um well when do you get to a point that in your writing like you you feel okay with it? Like, all right, this is good. I can put this out into the world. When I stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that's, that's the end. That's, you know, and, and Archibald McLeese 
who's a poet and translator to uh, about poetry, said that you, you don't finish a poem, you abandon it. And I think that's absolutely true, too. I don't think that's the same thing with prose. Um, so when you say pretentious, I'm thinking that in order to write good sentences, um, you, of course you don't want to be pretentious, you want to disappear. I mean, there's a part, part of writing in which you disappear, and it's brainwave stuff. You go into alpha, you have no conception of time. I don't know, anyway. I mean, in many ways, I mean, once you're, when you're really in it, you really have no, it's the only thing happening. And when it's the only thing happening, it cannot be anything other than honest and real. And it's usually the voice that you keep hearing in your head, in some ways, right? Because when you're writing, I don't know if, if it happens to you, but when I'm writing, I'm, I'm hearing it, right? At the same time that I'm putting it on the page. Um, and it's not in my voice. I couldn't be in my voice. I mean, listen to me. I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to hear anything. It was in my voice. But, but that is how you, you, you think of, you know, being pretentious or whatever. But also it makes me think that you should never, it's really important, I think, <laughs> not to be self-censoring. And, and, and by the way, the first draft could be completely pretentious. The first draft is nothing. It's like spilling the paint on the page and then saying what emerges. But it's always, I mean, when I write something for the first, when I start something, I cannot believe I've ever published a thing. It's so awful. It really is. And particularly with poetry. Because the real poem is always hiding somewhere. And it's never at the beginning. It's usually around the middle in the first draft. And with prose, you know, I'm not interested in telling a story as much as I am um, sort of tracing an emotional understanding of what it means to live in adversity and, you know, and what, what it's like to, to really live um, and survive. I don't know, I don't know, that sounds like an idiot when I say that, but it's challenging. It's really, really challenging. Just be true to yourself. But that also goes for your life. You should be surrounded by people that make you feel like yourself. Because then you'll begin to start writing from that place. You won't have anything left when you get to that point. You, you still want to be curious. You know what I mean? That's a really essential part of it, too. I'm still curious. I'm 67 years old. I'm still curious. You know, and, and right now I'm really interested in, in um, <laughs> I'm sort of obsessed with true crime. Um, you can blame me in cold blood for that, but. I find it fascinating. Anyway. And hard movies. Anybody else? Hi. Do we have time now? Yeah. Okay. Let me sit because I just had two knee operations. Uh, that would be the place. Oh. What's your name? Uh, my name's Catherine. Catherine? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm just curious because you, you write both prose and poetry. Uh, I'm just curious as to what your opinion is on the difference between the two because they seem so close together. Yeah, they can be. Um, a couple of things. Gary Snyder, who's a wonderful poet, once said, the difference between poetry and prose is that you can't force poetry, which I like that they're that definition. Um, and poetry is about distillation. It's also about the emo it's, it's about emotion, the life. The reason why it's so unpopular is not because people think it's above them or too difficult to understand. You know that whole myth. Oh, poetry, it's, uh, I don't understand what's going on. It's because people are afraid of feelings. They don't want to read about it. They don't care. You know, it's not a thing. We do not live in a culture in which feelings are important, really. And poetry, is, that's, all, it, that's what it is. Um, and E. Cummings, I, I hate to be quoting, but um, E. Cummings has this great thing. It's online. It's called, I think it's called Poet's Advice. But one of the things he says about being a poet is that um, to live in a world that is constantly trying to make you into somebody that you're not is um, the hardest battle to fight or something like that. He said um, a poet is somebody um, what is it? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, it's short. Um, whenever you think or believe or know, you're lots of other people. It's only when you feel that you're nobody but yourself. In a world that is constantly trying to make you into somebody else, um, this is the great challenge, blah, blah, blah. Poetry is one of the hardest things in the world to do, but I love it. If you want to do something easy, blow up the world. He actually says, this is from the 30s, 
And when you get to that sentence, you want to say, you walk into that, whoa, you know, anarchy. Um, but it's great advice. I mean, I love that whenever you think or believe or you know, you're lots of other people. It's only when you feel that you're nobody but yourself. And that's what poetry is. And prose, to a certain degree. But again, prose has a lot of cargo in it. They're part of, they're part of, it's just not, that's not the job of poetry. Um, and I, I think part of the job, I mean, all writing, I think, its job is to make you feel more alive to yourself. And poetry just does it in a different way. You know, but I love great novels. And I love, I just read, um, what did I read that I absolutely fucking loved? Um, oh. The Carson, Carson Colors is in the title, actually. Um, what is it? Do you know? It's a memoir. It's a, it's um, it's like a memoir about loving. What's that book called? The autobiography of Mike Carson. Oh yeah, it's it's not fiction actually. It's fantastic. And also Sidney Nunez, the the her new novel is fantastic. And you know, I, I mean, um, and poetic, but you know, in different ways. A not prose can be poetic in a way that's not just using strategies that poetry uses. The idea in the in the, you know a novel of ideas is a poetic. Thing, right? It's a poetic construct when you read an all of ideas. It's not, you know, like the end of the story by Lydia Davis. Um, do you guys know Lydia Davis? She's very popular um, for reasons that quite confound me, actually. I think the novel is great, but her short pieces are like, I have a poem about her where it, t where it talks about, you know, um, briefly, there's um, my friends with their mother at the Museum of Modern Art, and they're looking at Picasso's is called Bouquet of Peace, I believe, and it's a hand holding a, a bouquet of flowers. And my friend says to her mother, um, I could do that. And her mother looks at her and she says, yes, dear, but you didn't. And that's how I feel about Lydia Davis. I can do that, but no, you didn't. Right? It's like abstract art, like, you know, Rothko or anybody, you know, Rothko's fantastic, but if it's a black canvas or a yellow canvas, like, I can do that, but you didn't. That's a big deal that you didn't, or you know, that it was done that you didn't do it. It also makes the art more accessible. I think it makes the art uh, speak to more people in that way too. I don't believe in universality, actually. You know, that myth about, you know, I have to identify with it if I'm gonna have any appreciation of it. I wanna know about other lives. I don't wanna know people about people like me, you know? You don't want anything that way, really. Anyway, anybody else? Yes. One more. Good, one more question. You look familiar to me, you look familiar to me. I always get that. Has to really take a box of the wonderful cheese and fruit that our vending comes. Oh, those are beautiful. Or if we can take the And Michael's brought some books. I just want to get that in because a lot of people have to leave, I know. Um, so if you have any books that you want, any of his books that you'd like to purchase. Awesome. Sorry. Hi. Go ahead. <laughs> ask away, Meg. Um, I, this question might not even come out clearly at all. I don't know how to ask it, but I'll try. Hi, what's your name? I'm Meg. I'm Meg. English, English, whatever that means. <laughs> so, you mentioned the E.E. E. Cummings poem, whatever you think, believe, or know, that's other people. And then you talked about poetry being how you feel. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, when you write memoir, and you say that you have to get distance, mm -hmm. Where are you in that thinking, believing, knowing, feeling spectrum? That's a good question. Um, I'm far, I'm, 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 there's a distance between the thing I'm writing about and writing about it, right? Um, and the way that I look at it is that I look at, I, I sort of look at a vague narrative in terms of what actually happened, but I'm also thinking two things. I'm thinking about the way I feel now about that and I very rarely do I think, although I may say it in the sentence, but very rarely do I think in the same way that I did when it was happening. So that part is a fiction, do you know what I mean? And, and the only reason I do it is to make some sort of narrative connection. But I very rarely, because a lot of times I don't know what I felt at that particular time. And just knowing what happened doesn't necessarily give you that information. There could be a whole bunch of stuff going on into the side Right, that, that affect the way you feel about something that happened. So I don't really know, but uh, but I'm very invested in the way that I feel about now. If it was, and I really try, to, I always imagine it happening to somebody else, which Vivian Gornick actually talks about when she talks about memoir. 
that it, that got some really good ways of looking at it sometimes. It's, it's an instant way of being objective. But she also believes that when you write an essay that you have a persona, which is not necessarily yours, which I, and I was in a class with her once I disagreed with her. She got really mad. <laughs> I, just, I, I said, I don't, you know, I don't think that's true at all. And, and she didn't know what lyric, the lyric essay was, because she's never written one. She, and she also said, yeah, never mind, I'm not like that. I love Vivian Gornick, she's a great writer, but she's, she's a shark. <laughs> she's like, somebody once went up to her, if you don't know who Vivian Gornick is, she's a very well-known essayist and critic, um, and has written some fantastic books, and somebody went up to her once and said, oh, I, a very good writer, who, I don't know whether she knew her or not, but she said, um, Oh, I love Miss Garnett. I really, really. And she interrupted her and she said, Yeah, 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 I know. You love my work. <laughs> and cast her off. <laughs> so she was horrified. Yeah, yeah, I love your work. Anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Great questions. You know, writing's going to change the world. You know that, right? <laughs> that, seriously. When all is said and done, it's the writer. It's going to change though. But it's changing now. I mean, you know, you read somebody like um, Aaron Dottie Roy, the Indian um, not essay. It's, it's extraordinary. She's a psychic. It's incredible. It's a cult when you read her work. And a lot of, you know, Rebecca Solnit, Terry Tempest Williams. I'm thinking of writers that are really writing about the times that we're living through right now. And it's an extraordinary time. It really is. Um, so many things. So, and so much material. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Really fabulous. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.